This video is brought to you by my patrons. Close your eyes. Take your mind back to when you were just a kid. Transport yourself to your earliest, best childhood memory, whatever that was for you. Whether it's jumping, arms spread wide into a giant golden pile of leaves with your parents, or waking up on Christmas morning with the crisp winter cold in the tile nipping at your feet as you scamper to find presents under the tree, or building a fort out of sheets that spans the entire bedroom and is a kingdom unto itself. Whatever that memory is for you, hold on to it, feel it. But also, remember what it was like to be that child, longing to be older, longing to do all the things that the adults get to do. And later, the unease when those things suddenly become true, that creeping sense of dread, of change, as you no longer think the same, feel the same way as you did when you were still that child. Do you have it? Those feelings, that complex ball of emotion and nostalgia, all bundled up, is the essence of Over the Garden Wall, but pitched into a triumphant harmony. The entire show oozes that dreamy feeling of being a child again, but also the fear and the dread that we all felt once we aged out of it. Those deep-seated emotions are wrung out of us when watching the show, like oil from an Edelwood tree. I can't quite latch on to the exact memories that get dredged up when watching Over the Garden Wall or listening to its music. They are fleeting, dancing around like leaves on the wind with me for a moment and then gone just as quick. But the point isn't really those specific memories that the show evokes. It's the general feelings of childhood and growing up that come with them. What each of us gets out of it is dependent on our own experiences of being young. And that is something beautiful. It feels personal, like an inside joke that only I'm privy to. Yet today, as I was doing chores around the house, listening to the show's soundtrack, which is one of my new favorites, YouTube cut to a video retrospective of the series from another creator. And immediately in watching the first few minutes of that video, I noticed that he started it in a similar way to this script. Do me a favor. Close your eyes and think of the first thing that pops into your head when I say autumn. It can be anything. A movie, a day, a feeling, an emotion, anything. Now, to be fair, he was evoking the atmosphere of a golden autumn day, which, granted, is somewhat different. Yet, contrary to what I just said about the show being something personal and unique to each of its viewers, there's clearly something nearly universal about it. And it's definitely not just a coincidence born from a cliché intro into a video essay. It's not. Over the Garden Wall tells the story of two half-brothers, Wirt and Greg, who find themselves somehow lost in a mysterious and magical place called the Unknown. The Unknown is absolutely lousy with woods and strange characters who the main cast find themselves entangled with throughout the show. Chief among those is Beatrice the Bluebird, who befriends the brothers early on and promises to help them in their ultimate goal to find their way back home. The show's visual style and music are reminiscent of those popular in early 20th century America, the ones that are so foundational for so many of us. This show hit some hidden nostalgia button for me that I didn't even know that I had. From the very first moment of Over the Garden Wall, the creator Patrick McHale is clearly pulling from those early creations, like Flip the Frog, of which Kitty the Frog was a direct homage. In an interview with The Dot in Line, McHale said, one of the first and strongest inspirations was old trade cards and postcards, or chromolithographs. Also, just the feeling of autumn in New England. He expounds on this a bit in another interview with WeirdChristmas.com. I've always enjoyed going to antique shops, and postcards were something affordable that I could flip through and actually purchase even when I was younger. There's something about chromolithography that draws me in. I think it's because, like wax cylinder recordings, you can feel that they're not just reproductions of art. They're actual recorded art, like an actual fingerprint, rather than a photocopy of a fingerprint. I don't know if I'm making any sense here, but a certain era of postcards feels like it carries the ghosts of the artists and technicians who made them. Same goes for old books, I guess. You can literally feel the words on the page because they were pressed into the paper, or the gold foil pressed into the leather cover. Books aren't just a vessel for writing, they tell the story of their own creation, made of things that were once living. 
The life of an old thing, its earned texture is evoked in every frame of the show, every voice line, every piano riff. The show mixes these general feelings of Americana with the background of dark Germanic fairy tales like those of the Brothers Grimm. Establishing shots, at least early on, are often the ideal of a forest in autumn, with orange and gold warmth radiating outward. There is a slight, almost undetectable radial blur at the edges of the screen at all times. Combined with the vignette effect in certain scenes, compound with the other effects to make us feel like we're either in a dream or watching some old-timey silent film through a keyhole. And sometimes both. None of the characters are exact one-to-ones with classical fairy tales. They're more like amalgamations, pieced together from some half-remembered dream of those stories. Rather, there are general ideas and themes that fit some of those tales, like the obvious example of Hansel and Gretel being two lost siblings in the woods. Okay, so now that I say it out loud, that is pretty close. But other fairy tales, like The Frog Prince and Rumpelstiltskin, have their own parallels with the story. Instead, the characters stand in contrast with the world around them, and not just because they're in a fantasy land. Firstly, the show takes from the tradition of Japanese animation, namely that the backgrounds are often beautifully detailed canvas paintings, with relatively simplistic characters animated over them. But it's not just the visual style. They also stand apart from the natives to the unknown in their dialogue. The main bunch of the characters generally have the speech patterns of modern kids. Ah, Beans, where is that frog o' mine? Hold on there a second, brother o' mine. I'll be back soon for your plan. Or at least adolescents, while those around them harken back to the vernacular and even the accents of early to mid-century 1900s American Midwest. Oh, no. It's a beautiful contrast that is often woven so neatly together that it flies under the viewer's radar. Wirt is the eldest of the two brothers and is the self-insert for Over the Garden Wall. He's an interminably paranoid and submissive character, always deferring to everyone else's judgment except Greg's. He's wont to fall into bouts of depression, waxing philosophical as if possessed by some 18th century poet prone to assume dramatic failure at the first sign of trouble. Uh, oh, hey, guys. I don't know what he said, but it, it wasn't true. Oh, hey, Wirt, how's it going? Uh, hi, Wirt. Oh. Yet, Wirt, either consciously or subconsciously, reinforces those traits to the point of stubbornness. And that is often the source of the brothers' troubles. Wirt is an example of the excellent dialogue that can be found throughout the show. Often, he'll say something that I myself was thinking in the situation. Which, I don't know, might not be a good thing for me, but my point is that his dialogue, especially with Beatrice, is so inherently believable and natural, which can be boiled down to not only Elijah Wood's fantastic acting, but also the writing. It's clear that the dialogue writing is one of the main points of focus for Patrick McHale. In the interview with The Dot and Line, he says, I tend to enjoy just spending time with the characters and having them talk to each other and discover things in their environment, so I have to edit myself a lot for the audience's sake." Over the course of the show, Wirt changes the most out of the main cast. In addition to everything I mentioned already, he is initially a very selfish person. He, like many kids his age, gets stuck in his own head, but to an even more extreme degree. He refuses to see himself as the protagonist of his own life often assuming the worst possible outcomes before even trying, and this extends to his failures as well. Through most of the story, he blames Greg for his failures because he can't see himself as being in control of his own life. However, at the end of the story, when his folly is directly responsible for Greg's peril, his character growth is solidified. But we'll get to that later. Greg is the best, and I want him. I will name him George, and I will hug him and pet him and squeeze him. You are hurting me. He is the younger brother and serves as one of the two foils for Wirt. Greg is an enigma, a puzzle within a puzzle within a Russian doll within a bag of candy and puppies. He rarely has any serious dialogue, instead serving as the comedic relief most of the time. Though he isn't just pure chaos either. When things get serious and his brother or friends are in trouble, he steps up every time. A scamp with a heart of gold. 
He mainly just wants to make the world a better place, a place where he can continue his shenanigans without needing to worry about his brother or his friends. Basically, he's chaotic good. The final of the main trio is Beatrice, who joins the brothers after they venture into the unknown. She first appears in episode 1, but doesn't actually join until 2. Beatrice is a nihilist, or at least a pessimistic realist. She is the second foil to Wart. Where Greg contrasts his seriousness, Beatrice serves to contrast Wart's indecisive nature. She joins with the promise that she can take them to a mysterious woman named Adelaide of the Pasture, who can help them get back home. However, she has secret, ulterior motives relating to her nature of being a bluebird. Beatrice goes through a character arc as well, similar to Wirt's. While Wirt learns to overcome his nature of deferring to everyone but himself, Beatrice goes the opposite way. When the story begins, she is only looking out for herself, and her family, I guess, at the cost of all others. However, by the end, she is no longer even thinking of her own well-being, instead genuinely helping the boys find their way out of the unknown. I guess now I should mention the absolute stacked voice cast. It is completely insane. A random Cartoon Network show has no business with a cast like this. It's like a Studio Ghibli dub. Patrick McHale is even on record saying that everyone cast was on his wish list when he was creating the story. Have I hyped it up enough yet? Let's just name a few. Elijah Wood, Melanie Linsky, Tim Curry, Christopher Lloyd, John Cleese, Shirley Jones, Fred Stoller, Chris Isaac, and the great crooner Jack Jones. And that's just most of them. There's still way more. Now, the younger crowd of my audience may not recognize some of those names, but they were absolute giants of mid-century music and the silver screen. Shirley Jones, for example, was in the film adaptation of Oklahoma and other greats from the Golden Age of Musicals. Christopher Lloyd was, of course, the great Doc Brown from the Back to the Future series. John Cleese was from Monty Python and, like, a bunch of other stuff. And the list continues. Besides Shirley, the musical casting of Jack Jones and Chris Isaac is just iconic. Jones plays the frog that sings the intro into the series, and his smooth, dulcet toned voice introduces us to the brothers. To quote McHale on Isaac, When I was making the pilot, we got all sorts of auditions for John Crops, one of which was Chris Isaac's. I loved his audition a lot, his voice sounded so soothing, but it also reminded me of Sterling Holloway, in a way where the soothing quality could also be used for something a little creepy. Holloway played Winnie the Pooh, but also the Cheshire Cat. So when the series got picked up, I included the character Enoch just for him. And then we wrote a song for the episode because it's Chris Isaac. The pilot Mikhail is talking about here, Tome of the Unknown, isn't included in the main series. If you watch the show on Hulu or HBO Max, you'll miss out on it. But it is on YouTube. It's only nine minutes long, so go watch it real quick. Anyways, let's rewind a bit and talk about the pilot and how Over the Garden Wall came to be. If it wasn't obvious, everything after this point is going to contain spoilers for Over the Garden Wall, so if you haven't seen it, please go watch it now. Go check out the show because you will not regret it. All the way back in 2007, a recently graduated Mikhail pitched the idea of Over the Garden Wall along with some other projects to Cartoon Network. However, the execs at the network wanted him to produce it into a feature film, which he reportedly had trouble doing. So the series went on the back burner while Mikhail went on to help with other shows, such as The Marvelous Misadventures of Flapjack and Adventure Time. Clearly a creator interested in thoughtful adventures in strange worlds. However, Mikhail never gave up on Wirt and Greg, and in 2013 he created the short film Tome of the Unknown, which featured our favorite trio as they have an adventure in the endless forest. Notably, some of the voice cast is different from the main show. For example, Natasha Legero playing Beatrice instead of Melanie Linsky. In the film, the brothers are looking for a book, the eponymous Tome of the Unknown, which is a plot point that would be later dropped in the main series. On their journey, they encounter a man made of vegetables and his vegetable car, named John Crops, which is an amazing name for a dude with a watermelon torso. Crops is a crooner, just looking for love, played by the great Chris Isaac, as Mikhail mentioned in his interview. 
Sometimes, dear, I wonder why you keep away. The boys convinced John to drive into the city so that they might find someone to help them locate the book. But on the way there, a murder of crows attacks the car, looking to eat the tasty veggies, causing them to crash into a scarecrow in the middle of a cornfield. Luckily, the city is just outside that cornfield. They finally make it to the town and find a band of musicians playing to a crowd. That's you, Crops! Go croon a tune under the moon with a raccoon, eating prunes with a spoon and a bowl. Meanwhile, Wirt and Beatrice try to fix the vegetable car. They succeed, but it turns out that the car was holding the broken scarecrow upright, and as they pull away, it falls down. With no more deterrent to keep them away, the crows begin attacking the city. Things are in chaos when Wirt and Beatrice arrive. Greg joins them, but John Crops, who found a beautiful cabbage lady, stays behind. However, as the main trio tries to leave the city, they are swarmed by various animals who begin attacking and eating the car. Greg hops out and runs into the cornfield, and we hear a scream. When Wirt catches up to him, it turns out he wasn't attacked by an animal or anything like that. Instead, well... Goose. The episode ends with a narration by John Crops and his new love, reminiscent of the early 20th century films that Mikhail is emulating here. Tome of the Unknown was released in 2013 to critical acclaim and was shown to multiple film festivals. Yet, as much as I love the aesthetic that Mikhail uses for the show, and make no mistake, it's here all in the pilot, there is just something missing for me. It, it has a hole in it. I think the main reason is that the book the boys are after is never explained, barely talked about, and is just a disposable plot device that the show discards and barely mentions outside the opening narration. It just doesn't work for me as a driving force, and it kind of gives the impression that the boys are just wandering with no real purpose, even if that's not literally the case. This is fixed in the main show, of course. The concept of the Tome of the Unknown is discarded entirely, and instead, the boys' need to get back home is the actual driving force that pushes them forward. Regardless, after releasing the pilot to such a claim, Cartoon Network greenlit the series Mikhail had wanted. The story only took 10 episodes to tell, not the three seasons initially planned, and it's honestly for the best. It sets out to tell a story and does so without any fluff. So. Let's actually get into the main show, because I need to talk about this absolute masterpiece. The first episode sets the tone immediately, with Kitty, or George Washington, or whatever the damn frog's name is, it, it changes every episode, <clears throat> crooning over a beautiful piece played on twangy piano strings. We see these little vignettes showing many of the characters in the unknown, little snippets of the people with whom we'll soon become acquainted. We then move to the boys trekking through a dark forest, Wirt just realizing that they are lost and unsure of how they got there in the first place. This first scene does a wonderful job at setting up the two characters, so let's break it down. First, the catalyst. They hear a chopping sound out in the darkness. <gasps> Do you hear that? Yeah. Wirt, a neurotic, tangled bundle of adolescent nerves, immediately decides to go the other way, afraid of what they might find. On the other hand, Greg, ever the optimistic explorer, immediately beelines toward the sound, completely unafraid. It's an exceedingly simple yet effective way to show us the personalities of these characters we've just been introduced to. And I love it. When they get there, they meet their new bird friend, Beatrice, though meet cute it is not. A bird's brain isn't big enough for cognizant speech. Hey, what was that? I mean... Come to find out, the wood was being chopped by a woodsman. Go figure. For safety, the woodsman takes them back to his home, the old grist mill. Though he is generally kind, there's something that feels off about the woodsman and the wood that he carries. There's something he's not saying. And the wood? Its design has black ends which don't match the rest of it. Later on, we see him grinding it into oil, which he says he uses to keep his lantern lit. Back at the mill, Wirt falls into an existential crisis with one of his bouts of poetic language. A boat upon a winding river, twisting towards an endless black sea. Uh. Meanwhile, Greg realizes that he's lost his frog at some point, so he goes out on his own to look for him. Kitty! 
Now where did that frog named Kitty go? He instead finds a rabid hound beast thing. No hyperbole, this hound is one of the most terrifying things in animation that I have ever seen. I can only imagine how frightened 10-year-old me would have been watching this, and it makes me wonder who this show was made for, other than, you know, me. After a harrowing confrontation though, the hound falls off the roof and gets squished by the water wheel. For a second, I thought the show was going to have a very dark, gory turn, but instead it just caused the dog to cough up a turtle. And oh boy, the turtles. There is a thriving fan community for this show online, and the turtles are the subject of many a fan theory. However, Patrick McHale in the interview said that they are, quote, an imperfection in the quilt. Basically, they needed something that was causing the dog to act that way. Someone said, how about turtles? And they ran with it. Maybe it's a bit underwhelming as explanations go, but there's plenty left to analyze with the show. Anyways, once relieved of his shell shock, the dog returns to his normal form. The boys believe the dog to be the beast that the woodsman warned them about, and Wirt also blames the whole ordeal on Greg and his candy. But the woodsman disabuses them of both notions fairly quickly. You are the elder child. You are responsible for you and your brother's actions. What we later learn is that the wood the woodsman is grinding into oil comes from the Edelwood tree, a special tree found in the unknown. The prefix Edel comes from German, meaning noble, precious, or pure. The name hints towards the fact that not only are the trees rare, but they come from the souls of innocent children lost in the woods. We even see twisted faces found in the bark of the trees, hinting at this later revelation. As I mentioned, the oil drips from the bark, giving it an ominous look, with blackened ends really punctuating that something isn't right with the trees, even before we know exactly what. The second episode begins with some beautiful nature shots, a la my boy Hayao Miyazaki. A leaf is battered by the autumn wind, then breaks off and flies away, etc. It's great, and I love it. The quick cuts stop, and we arrive on the boys walking through a gorgeous, amber-painted canvas of the forest. It's the first time we've seen the unknown in the daytime, and each of these first shots make us realize that this place is not all creepy. It has plenty of hidden beauty and wonder. Greg hears a noise, and when he investigates it, finds Beatrice, the bluebird, stuck in a bush. The same bird that they met last episode. She tells them of a wise woman named Adelaide of the Pasture who can supposedly help them get home. However, no, 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 no. Magic talking birds leading us to fairy godmothers. Instead, he follows a sign leading towards a town called Pottsfield, where he hopes to get directions. Pottsfield is no normal town. At first, it appears to be abandoned. Well, save for this guy. Oh, sorry. Uh, I'm looking for a phone. But they soon find that the inhabitants of Pottsfield are engaged in some sort of celebration, all of them wearing pumpkin costumes. One thing that is especially accentuated in this episode is the dialogue. It perfectly complements the characters. Wirt, the neurotic brother, and Beatrice, the world-weary bird person, is perfectly encapsulated in this exchange. Elijah Wood and Melanie Linsky both give an amazing performance as well, and all of it really just clicks and grounds the characters despite the fantastical setting. On the other hand, you're just waiting for the next strange thing that comes out of Greg's mouth. Or take off our pumpkin shoes! Unfortunately for the boys, they are immediately interrogated by the leader of the Pottsfielders, Enoch. <laughs> now let me get this straight. You come to our town, you trample our crops, you interrupt our private engagement, now you want to leave. Enoch is yet another example of the excellent casting in the show. His booming, baritone, sing-song voice fills your ears and simultaneously mesmerizes you while also sending a shiver down your spine. Fortunately for the boys, they are only sentenced to a few hours of manual labor. Wait, what? However, after some menial chores, the boys are set to digging holes and Wirt again assumes the worst. We're digging our own. Uh, I, I was wrong. Thinking that the holes are to be their graves, but it's quite the opposite. They were really digging up some friends. Turns out, 
Pottsfield is inhabited entirely by skeletons. Enoch asks Wirt if he'd like to stay in Pottsfield, but Wirt refuses, still not trusting the townies. In response, the town leader makes a final ominous comment. Oh well, you'll join us someday. Uh... The episode closes on a leaf stuck in a fence. And if you're confused about it, remember the very first shot. As Wirt says in episode 8, This fog is deeper than we can ever understand. We are but wayward leaves, scattered to the air by an indifferent wind. The leaf shots can be interpreted as a mirror of the boys on their journey, wandering the unknown, stuck on the fence between leaving and staying, or between life and death, depending on your interpretation. Which is, I think, a good excuse to talk about the interpretations of this series. There are a lot of them. Some people seem to think that the entire show is an allegory for the afterlife or purgatory, or that they're just literally in one of those places. Others take the more direct, literal interpretation, given the ending. In other words, it was all just a dream. While I don't think there's anything wrong necessarily with those and other interpretations, except the fact that the latter is just boring, so one thing wrong, I guess, I tend to think of the show in different terms. To me, the entire show represents the journey from adolescence into adulthood, because it is a journey, really and all the anxiety and dread that comes with it, hence this video's intro. The liminal space between those two states of being is often scary, filled with dangers and wonders in equal measure. To put simply, it's the unknown. Many of the characters in the series represent ideals or fears that the boys face as they travel their path, a path similar to our own but wholly unique as well. Now, I want to stop here and really delve into the music of Over the Garden Wall. I've mentioned it a couple of times already, but it is truly fantastic, and it turns a good show into one of the greats in my eyes. It's honestly one of the many reasons that I decided to talk about this show in the first place. The intro for the entire show, Into the Unknown, is this hauntingly somber plea sent into the void. It's also the song I played at the beginning, which is my own rendition. It perfectly sums up the meaning of the entire show in a single song, about the anxieties of growing up and our fragile memories of our youths. They are, in a way, their own sorts of fairy tales. Memories, the loveliest lies of all. Once again, it is sung by the great Jack Jones, an extremely influential pop and big band crooner in the style of Frank Sinatra. Jones's voice lends a weight and sadness to the piano that just makes me want to close my eyes and sway back and forth. It is truly wonderful. But not only that, the songs sung by Greg's voice actor, Colin Dean, are just quaint and lovable with catchy melodies. While not the most technically proficient singer, his childlike voice adds a layer of whimsy to the songs that would not be achievable with an adult, particularly the tune Potatoes and Molasses, which is also in this episode. Meanwhile, even the background music is great, which really accentuate that mid-century Americana feel that is so prevalent throughout the show. As they're walking again through the woods, Beatrice is making the argument that Greg should be less like Wirt who she believes to be a pushover. What? I'm not a pushover. Hold on, Wirt. Let me get to my point. <sighs> Fine. See, Greg? No willpower whatsoever. The trio find a school for animals who can't read good. What is this? A center for ants! And while Greg runs off to be free, Wirt goes inside. Moreover, he decides to follow the teacher's commands, pretending to be a student. No, no, let's go. Oh, no. See, I'm a pushover, remember? I have to do what she tells me to do. Miss Langtree, played by Janet Klein, is a scorned lover whose bow ran off and left her. She sings her own song, and you guessed it, it's great. A is for the apple that he gave to me, but I found a worm inside. Also, there's a gorilla terrorizing the town, apparently. Meanwhile, Greg is skipping class with some of the animal children. However, they eventually rejoin the others for mealtime where he sings the song Potatoes and Molasses. Just a warm and 
soft like puppies in socks filled with cream and candy. Seriously, the soundtrack is on YouTube. Go listen to it. However, during this song, Miss Langtree's father, who is funding the school, comes to break things up and take the instruments away. We later find out it's because he's having money problems and can't keep the school open otherwise. So Greg hatches a plan to steal back the instruments and host a benefit concert for the school. And everything turns out all right in the end. Even the gorilla situation is wrapped up. It turns out that it was Jimmy Brown in costume the whole time, played by Thomas Lennon, yet another amazing actor. But when I got stuck in the dang suit, everybody was too doggone scared to help me out. This episode, which is a great deal lighter in tone than the first two, serves to give more characterization to the main trio via the contrast with their respective foils. In particular, it contrasts Greg's boundless optimism to make the world a better place with everyone around him, namely Miss Langtree and her father. They both started out with grand ideals to make the world a better place, vis-a-vis -vis their school but lost their way due to seemingly insurmountable obstacles, the disappearance of Jimmy Brown and the loss of funding. Greg, however, is an infinite font of positivity and through sheer force of will creates a better world, at least for this small section of the unknown. Meanwhile, the rest of the episode paradoxically hinges on Wirt's stubbornness to spite Beatrice's point about him being a pushover, which demonstrates that he isn't one. Everything bad that happens to them in this episode, and really in all the episode, hinges on Wirt's folly. We see that despite Wirt's age and intelligence, he still has a lot that he could learn from his younger brother. In episode 4, which is probably my favorite of the season, the boys get stuck in a roadside inn looking for directions to Adelaide's house. The episode begins with them riding in the back of a farmer's wagon, who ends up taking them off course as he is afraid that the beast was chasing him. They arrive in the middle of the night with a storm brewing and the inn does not look at all inviting. Immediately after sitting down at the table though, Beatrice is kicked out because the innkeeper believes that she will bring bad luck. So she goes out to the stables and begins chatting up the horse being kept there. We hear someone singing about chopping wood to light the fire and are led to believe that it's the woodsman. Meanwhile, Wirt tries to get directions from the patrons, each of them being the archetype of their profession. He's the butcher. I'm the butcher. The baker. Yeah! The midwife. Oh. The master and apprentice. The innkeeper asks Wirt who he is, meaning what he does, what role he fills, because those are the only terms that the patrons can think in. It's almost like the show is trying to do a social commentary about how we, especially in the US, put so much stock into our professions and who they make us as people, and how maybe that's not such a good thing, like we are more than the company that we work for or the job we perform. Yet what is our default second question anytime meeting someone new? What do you do for a living? But no, certainly the show isn't saying anything like Wirt doesn't know how to respond to the question though. I'm Wirt. I'm, I'm just a, a guy, I, I guess. Um, wh what do you mean? Thus begins a musical montage. These characters just love talking and singing about their archetypes, which is very nice when I'm trying to do an analysis. The mysterious highwayman kicks off the thing with a low down bluesy baritone voice and some seriously unsettling fluid animation reminiscent of early century cartoons, especially Betty Boop, considering the innkeeper's design. Then, Wirt makes the mistake of asking the toy maker about Adelaide, who mistakes him as a lovesick boy. Oh, 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 you're not the witless, simple-minded fool everybody takes you for. And thus begins probably my favorite song of the entire series. Having settled on Wirt being the archetypal lover, the inn goads him into singing his own song, which Wirt flounders through. But the tavern soon realizes that he isn't the lover after all. Hey! Uh, yes? I know what you are. You're a pilgrim. What? What, like the, the guys who eat turkey and cranberry sauce? No, you're a pilgrim. The innkeeper learns that the trio have been trying to avoid the beast, implying that the woodsman is the beast. Wirt desperately tries to tell the patrons that he isn't a lover or a pilgrim, that he just needs directions. And you can really feel his frustration here. You don't need directions, pilgrim. You follow that compass inside your heart. Uh, 
No, I think we need direction. The entire time, he's just been trying to accomplish this supremely simple task, but has been held up at every turn and instead has been pigeonholed into being something that he is not. Twice. Eventually, though, there is a scream from outside. Beatrice is in trouble. And so, Wirt uncharacteristically runs out to help her. He finds Beatrice underneath the woodsman and takes action. For a moment, he found his archetype, the hero. Later on, Beatrice wakes up to find them riding the horse from the inn, who can talk, and who finally gave Wirt directions that he'd been looking for. At the end of the episode, the form of the beast is revealed as he taunts the woodsman. It is our first look at the character, and it is one hell of an introduction. We simultaneously learn that it was also the beast that was singing about cutting down wood earlier in the episode, like a siren calling to wayward travelers. When asked in the Dot and Line interview which of the characters was hardest to conceptualize, Mikhail responds, Probably the beast. He went through a lot of variations before we settled on his final look and character. Early on, he was just the devil himself, and then he was actually the woodsman, uh, and then a bunch of different types of creatures. It kept changing and changing. And this makes sense, right? That it would be so hard to conceptualize such an amorphous being, one that is more personification than person. The beast, at least in my eyes, is a symbolic representation of all those little persistent fears that we have as we leave our childhood behind. The depression, anxiety, all that fun stuff. And what is that anxiety if not a beast that haunts our dreams and hides in our shadows? For the record, I think that they nailed the look. Just a simple, shadowy silhouette, somehow darker than the night surrounding it, but with eyes that pierce right through into the deepest, hidden parts of your heart. The episode as a whole seems to be a reference to Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, where every character is named after their profession, where the narrator joins the group at an inn and goes on a pilgrimage to Canterbury Castle. Seeing the parallels? These patrons each have set predestined roles that they are filling, and immediately try to rationalize Wirt in that context. However, Wirt doesn't see himself that way. In fact, the episode brings into stark relief the fact that Wirt doesn't know who he is. He's just... I'm Wirt. I'm, I'm just a, a guy, I, I guess. The uncertainty of self is one of the main reasons that he's so constantly neurotic and depressed, because he not only doesn't have a good self-image, he doesn't really have one at all. Yet, by the end of the episode, he realizes that being forced into one of those roles isn't going to work either. Instead, we the viewer see that it is his actions, saving Beatrice, that gives him his role as the hero. Now, we all cycle through multiple identities in our lives, sometimes rapidly. Real people aren't like the archetypes at the inn. And just like us, Wirt will cycle himself. He will backtrack. He will stumble as the story progresses. But the story also wanted us to see him take this action for a reason, to see who he can be. Episode 5 begins in media res, with the boys eating supper with, and in the home of, the man they claim is their uncle, Quincy Endicott, delightfully played by the great John Cleese. By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Their uncle is rich, having made his fortune selling tea. Ah, never touched the stuff myself. Blech, me either. Ha ha, yes, it's all for the money, yes, the money takes my mind off my- And living alone has caused his mind to fray. Low-key, Quincy is a pretty cutting, if cartoonish, critique of the massively wealthy. Quick to anger, covetous, scatterbrained, kind of like a certain chief twit. Anyway, the party needs some coins, two coins to be exact, to get on the ferry, which will take them to Adelaide, a clear allusion to Sharon the ferryman, who takes people across the river Styx in the Land of the Dead from Greek mythology. Regardless, they decide to scam old Endicott and steal some of his money, or really, Beatrice and the horse does. Wirt isn't sure how to feel about it, and Greg is Greg. Endicott is clearly worried about something, though. Uh, yes, yes, maybe it would be, be good to, to talk to someone. Well, it, it actually, it all began one day when I was exploring. And proceeds to tell them a story about roaming his labyrinthine manor and finding the ghost of a beautiful woman that he has fallen in love with. 
Greg wants to see the ghost, and the others want to find something to steal, so the party separates. While Wirt and Beatrice are searching together, they get stuck in a wardrobe and have a moment alone to bond somewhat. Beatrice lets slip that not only was she once human, but her entire family was turned into bluebirds because of something that she did. You used to be human? Did I know that? I, I don't think I knew that. Jiminy Crick. Wirt, reciprocating, tells Beatrice that he has a crush on a girl back home named Sarah, but he's just been too afraid to do anything about it. They are not the same. Eventually, they find the ghost, only to realize she actually isn't a ghost. Instead, she's just a normal living woman, another wealthy tea seller, in fact. Their houses are just so large that they had grown into each other, like trees planted too close together. The two Richie Riches fall in love and plan to merge their businesses, and Uncle Endicott gives the boys the fairy fee. Two pennies. How philanthropic of him. Though Greg throws it away for an amazing dad joke. Cause Uncle Endicott pegged me all wrong. I've got no sense. No sense at all. Worth it. The episode centers around the madness of Quincy Endicott. He is a lesson to the boys of going it alone. Even if one is successful, doing so by yourself isn't going to lead to happiness. Endicott is, on the surface, a cheery character when the boys are around. But we see glimpses of his true self poke out, and are left to wonder if that is what he's like when he's by himself. Accusation! I see it now! You're after my money! Do you know what I did for this money? He has clearly gone somewhat mad, to the point that he doesn't even know the bounds of his house anymore, or remember what caused this mess in the bedroom. Luckily, by the end, the boys are able to bring Endicott and Grey together. It's an apt lesson that, to succeed, we need those around us. I have to admit that the crowd theorizing that the unknown is a metaphor for death does have a point. Especially in this episode, it's not only the coins for the fairy, but also the questions of whether or not Quincy and Marguerite are ghosts. It's left ambiguous. See, in episode 9, we get a glimpse at the real world, and there's a gravestone with Indicott's name on it indicating that he is dead and the boys are interacting with his spirit. But regardless of your take, the creators left it ambiguous enough that either theory could be correct. In fact, Mikhail spoke on this as well. We often purposefully kept things vague because I wanted people to be able to interpret things in more than one way. Some theories have been pushed further than we originally intended, but I think most of the core concepts were things we at least thought about if not consciously included. Episode 6 is set on the last day before the party reaches Adelaide. The group rides the ferry down the river on the way to her house. Note that it's the same ferry that we saw the two boys releasing into the stream in the intro of the series, or at least a representation of it. Also, after a brief one-episode hiatus, the amazing music is back, and we get another Jack Jones tune. The fairy is filled with frogs, which makes Greg's frog, now named George Washington, self-conscious about his nudity. Feel these cold feet. No, he's supposed to be cold, Greg. He's a frog. Meanwhile, since Greg threw the pennies away in the last episode, they had to sneak on board, avoiding the frog guards. Frog guards, if you will. Throughout the episode, Beatrice seems to be having second thoughts about taking the boys to Adelaide. Of course, we soon learn why. Adelaide isn't some benevolent woman just willing to help them. The party gets found out by the Froggards, though, and in an attempt to escape, they pull a Vincent adult man. I went to the stock market today. I did a business. By joining the fairy band. George Washington, the frog, croons in his warm, mellow, butterscotch voice and woos the passengers into letting them stay. A single soul sets his voice singing. After the ferry lands, George Washington is swarmed by the other frogs and is offered a record deal. You done good, Mr. President. You done good. Beatrice leaves the boys while they sleep and goes to Adelaide to plead with her not to take them. Adelaide declines, however. Notice that Adelaide has the red hourglass on her back, the same as on a black widow spider. Not to mention her den is filled with weaves of string, her web. This is imagery directly relating to her character, being a woman that lures her prey into her den only to use them until they ostensibly die. Wirt wakes up finding Beatrice missing, 
and the boys follow her to the house and get trapped in the web momentarily before Beatrice saves them by melting Adelaide with the night air. <gasps> Night air is poisonous! Breathe it in, lady. We're at Greg. Let's go. A Wizard of Oz nod, I guess. Before she dies, though, Adelaide reveals that she is working for the beast. I do as he commands, the voice of the night. The boys leave Beatrice behind after finding out about her betrayal. However, as the episode ends, George Washington comes back to Greg, leaving the record deal behind. So they lost one, but they gained one. Lullaby in Frogland centers around the budding friendship between Wirt and Beatrice. In the last episode, they opened up to each other, finally. And by the time they get on the ferry, they've obviously grown closer. In fact, Beatrice is the one that convinces Wirt to play the bassoon in the band. A small thing, perhaps, but it represents Wirt stepping out of his comfort zone for someone else for the first time since episode 4. Once again, for Beatrice. And it's clear that Beatrice values their friendship as well. She was willing to give herself into servitude to Adelaide, give up the chance to make her family human again, all to keep the boys safe. Unfortunately, she wasn't willing to just tell the truth to the boys, which could have possibly avoided the trouble in the first place. It could have given them the opportunity to make a plan together or figure out any number of other ways to get home and help her family. Again, the lesson being, that we can't accomplish our goals alone, and that we need those around us, our family, our friends, to make it in the harsh world. On to episode seven. We open with a melancholy piano accompanying the soft patter of rain from outside. A forlorn Beatrice looks through Adelaide's house for the pair of scissors that can transform her family back into humans. Elsewhere, Wirt and Greg are once again traveling the woods alone, trying to be independent of Beatrice's assistance. One thing to note, on HBO Max, this episode's video and audio is horribly out of sync by about like a second or two. So when you watch this series, be sure to do it on Hulu if you can. The woodsman makes his return, warning the boys about the beast yet again. However, Wirt still thinks the woodsman himself is the beast, so they run away, and in doing so find a rundown, apparently abandoned old house. They quickly find out the house is not, in fact, abandoned, but instead occupied by a woman, Lorna, and her aunt, Auntie Whispers. The latter is a great example of a creator using the appearance of a character to play on the viewer's prejudice. I also want to mention that Auntie Whispers is played by the great Tim Curry, of Command and Conquer fame. I'm escaping to the one place that hasn't been corrupted by capitalism. Space! Yeah, I know he played in a bunch of other better things like Rocky Horror Picture Show, but fuck, I love the fuck out of that clip. He's trying so hard not to laugh. It's amazing. In 2012, Tim Curry suffered a stroke, which left him wheelchair-bound and affected his ability to voice act. However, as he said himself, the character of Auntie Whispers called for the type of performance that he was able to give. The result is a very subdued performance that sounds so strange, almost like she's drugged out on Xanax, which is a direct result of his condition. The ringing of the bell commands you. To adult me, this very subdued, monotone acting is hilarious. Knowing Tim Curry, he was probably going for that, making the most out of his condition to deliver a fantastic performance. However, just like the dog in episode one, this would have absolutely scared the ever-living shit out of me as a kid. Once again, I'm left wondering why the fuck they made this show for children. Auntie Whispers doesn't want anybody interacting with Lorna, and in fact is seemingly holding her captive and compelling her to do chores using a magical bell. Wirt and Greg stick around in secret, and the older brother starts to fall in love with Lorna. He thinks she is being taken advantage of, and tries to convince her to escape. However, the chaotic good cyclone that is Greg causes, well, chaos. So we came here to burgle your turts. No, it's, and it's reveals that Lorna is being held by Auntie Whispers for good reason. Oh, oh, for some reason I thought that old lady was the people eater, but it was Lorna all along. It just goes to show you stuff. They are eventually successful in exercising the evil spirit. At the very end, we see another interaction between the woodsman and the beast, which reveals their pact. 
that the woodsman will keep the lantern lit so his daughter's spirit, who supposedly resides within, will not be snuffed out along with a flame. It didn't sit right with me that the beast would care about the woodsman's daughter when he so flagrantly wants to use children to create more Edelwood trees. However, we'll soon learn the reason for that, so let's not get ahead of ourselves. The ringing of the bell goes out of its way to show us Wirt's growth as a character. He has, for all intents and purposes, fulfilled the archetype set out at the end of episode 4. He has become the hero. He not only saved the day for Lorna and Beatrice, but it was his quick bassooning that saved them, with help from George Washington, on the ferry. We, the audience, and Greg can see this. The only problem is Wirt still can't. In fact, at the end of the episode, directly after performing his heroic deed, he begins to fall down the well of depression again. It's frustrating for us, but if you've ever known anybody suffering from depression, then you'll know that nothing about it is logical. Everything in the world can be going right for them, but that doesn't necessarily correlate to a good state of mind. On the other side of the equation is Greg, who is a glowing bell of hope. We only wish that he could compel Wirt like the magical bell does for Lorna. Still, he tries valiantly. He goes along with Wirt to the house even though he is uncharacteristically unnerved by it. Now, to find some place to wait out this rain. As long as it's not that Whoa. broken down. Shh. He is able to keep Wirt's spirits up for the episode and even plays a hand in saving Lorna. His back must be hurting with how much he's carrying the duo. Because despite how heroic Wirt was, it is incredibly difficult to manage somebody's emotions on top of going through something as terrifying as their trek through the unknown has been. All on top of the fact that he gets blamed for everything going wrong. Episode 8 starts with the boys floating in an outhouse with Greg paddling with a guitar. Wirt is at his lowest point that we've seen him, once again turning into an 18th century poet. It must be the beast out there. The obsidian cricket of our inevitable twilight singing our requiem. They reach dry land where Wirt finally gives up and decides to sleep on the side of a tree. He, yet again, blames Greg for their predicament, refusing to take any responsibility himself. Greg, however, interprets this as his older brother telling him to take the lead. Are you saying... I should be the leader? I don't care what you do. He goes to sleep next to Wirt and asks the stars to help him out with the monumental task. Two. And if you don't, I don't care. I'll pull down your underwear. As he dreams, the stars turn into cherubs who whisk him away via a donkey bed chariot into Cloud City, which is a kind of 1930s analog of heaven. We're the Cloud City Reception Committee, and we are here to welcome thee. The sequence takes up most of the episode and seems to be, simultaneously, a reference to The Wizard of Oz, as well as early 20th century musical shorts, like those by the Fleischer Brothers or Disney's Silly Symphonies. The entire thing is great, but I especially love the gag about the Auxiliary Reception Committee. And we're the Cloud City Auxiliary Reception Committee. In addition to the normal reception committee, of course. Many shots throughout the sequence use a vignette effect, emulating the action being viewed through a porthole or a telescope, perhaps a reference to the early animation device known as a zoopraxiscope or a finic... Uh, Finnekistoscope, as you can see here. Regardless, it's meant to play into the production of the sequence, like we're watching it with some phantom theater audience. We can even see the silhouettes of those other viewers from time to time. In their musical, Greg accidentally lets loose the North Wind, the villain of Cloud City. Meanwhile, in real life, a cold front, aka a North Wind, comes in, putting the boys in danger of freezing. A fairy godmother type character comes down from on high to offer her assistance. Greg asks her if she can get them home, but she can only send him, not Wirt. So Greg, the show's guiding light and personification of hope, decides to sacrifice himself to the beast to save his brother. Wirt comes to his senses shortly after and realizes that Greg is lost. It's left ambiguous whether or not the dream or the fairy were real, or whether she really helped Wirt. But regardless, he is reinvigorated to find his brother. He's the most determined we've seen him at any point other than when saving Beatrice, 
When the chips are down and his friends are in trouble, Wirt steps up. He does so a little too vigorously, though, and winds up almost drowning. But finally, Beatrice comes to save the day for him. This episode, titled Babes in the Wood, is named after a traditional English folktale. Luckily for us, the episode is quite a bit lighter than the original, as to quote the wiki entry on it. The story tells of two small children left in the care of an aunt and uncle after their parents' death. The uncle gives the children to ruffians to be killed in order to acquire their inheritance. The murderers fall out, and the milder of the two kills the other. Then, the children wander alone in the woods until they die. Their bodies are covered with leaves by the birds. In sanitized versions, the children are taken to heaven. It is a morality tale, intended to warn people in the care of orphans not to treat them badly, as it ends with the uncle getting his comeuppance. However, in our version of the tale, the boys, lucky for us, don't get unalived. Rather, they find a way out of their plight with help from benevolent strangers. But yeah, just more fuel to the fire for the people who think that the entire show is a metaphor for the afterlife, I guess. Episode 9 begins in the real world and tells the story of how the boys wound up in the unknown in the first place. We see Wirt in his room. He has a mixtape he wants to give to his crush, Sarah. He goes back and forth on it, even throwing it away, but eventually builds up enough courage to take it to her. The reason behind the strange outfits is finally revealed. It was Halloween. Greg's teapot hat is supposed to make him an elephant, and Wirt, I'm still really not sure what he was going for. Wizard, maybe? Wirt goes to the football game where Sarah is working as a bee mascot. Except he doesn't do anything, he just stands there, too self-conscious to give her the tape. Lucky for him though, Greg comes to save the day. He takes the tape from Wirt, forcing him to act. They run into a few girls from their class who tell them that Jason Funderburker is going to ask Sarah out later, so Wirt had better hurry. Ugh, everybody loves Funderburker. However, this doesn't help the matter. Wirt is such a defeatist that he immediately gives up, and it's only Greg's insistent prodding that gets him to act throughout the episode. As I mentioned before, Wirt tends to think the worst about every situation. He thinks that people at school hate him, even though they immediately accept him when he shows up at the party. I don't know what he said, but it, it wasn't true. Oh, hey, Wirt, how's it going? Yeah, hi, man. Oh, uh, yeah. He thinks that Sarah doesn't like him, when she clearly does. Oh, Wirt, you're here. Well, I... I was just asking if you were here. Oh, wow. He thinks that Jason Funderburker is some suave ladies' man when he's, well, Jason Funderburker. Hey, Sarah. Are you ready to go? Ugh, everybody loves Funderburker. Even when these things are directly refuted in front of him, he can't get out of his own head. This is the Wirt from before the series, and we have slowly seen him grow out of this, so seeing it again is kind of shocking. It provides a good contrast with the growth that he has experienced. The boys go to the party to try to get the tape out of Sarah's pocket, where the girls from earlier left it, and when that doesn't work, they follow Sarah and the group of friends to the graveyard. Everything looks as though it's about to work out for a moment, as the group immediately accepts Wirt. But then a cop shows up. The kids scatter, thinking they're in trouble. To get away, Wirt and Greg climb over a literal garden wall, or a graveyard wall, I guess. Maybe there's a garden nearby. Who knows? Wirt is in the middle of berating Greg and getting ready to go back home when a train comes and they have to dive to get out of the way, narrowly avoiding it. The episode ends when Wirt wakes up in the tree with Beatrice's family. Beatrice, however, is missing. We close on Wirt going out into the snow, alone, to find his brother and friend. I've already harped on it a lot, but throughout this episode we see the selfish behavior of Wirt that I mentioned at the beginning. He constantly assumes people hate him, that he isn't worth their attention, at least everyone except for Greg. To him, he has only contempt. He takes all of that self-loathing and heaps it onto Greg. He constantly blames his little brother throughout the series for getting them stuck in the unknown. But now we finally see that, as we suspected, it was Wirt's own folly that led them there. Mistake after mistake, yet he could not accept culpability for it. And Greg, bless his heart, takes it all in stride. 
He just loves his brother. Finally though, in the end, Wirt realizes this. He has a true growth of character, and we satisfyingly see him take the responsibility for everything and truly accept the role as the hero. The final episode begins with Beatrice searching for and briefly finding Greg before being rebuffed by the wind. We next see Greg interacting with the Beast. They have made a bargain. The Beast agreed to tell Greg how he and Wirt can get home, but first has set out a list of impossible tasks. For instance, the Beast asks Greg to put the sun in a cup. Greg, however, uses his out-of-the-box whimsical cleverness to wait for the sun to set, where, from a certain perspective, it looks to be going into the cup. Just gotta wait. Just gotta wait. This is a common trope from myths called loophole abuse and can be found in mythology from all around the world. Ultimately, the beast is trying to wear Greg down, knowing that he will eventually be taken by the Edelwood tree and harvested to provide the lantern more oil. Meanwhile, the woodsman is trying to keep his lantern alight, but he has run out of Edelwood bark. The beast calls out to him, showing him that Greg is now becoming the next adult tree. It seems as though the woodsman has been in denial about the source of his oil. He knew the nature of the beast, that it preys on children, and he knew there was something off about the trees. He just didn't want to put the pieces together, so he didn't. Beatrice and Wirt reunite and eventually stumble upon Greg, who indeed has already been surrounded by the Edelwood branches. They also find the woodsman's lantern lying on the ground. The beast comes to them as they try to free Greg and attempts to make a bargain with Wirt to become the new woodsman, ostensibly the deal he made with the original one. Take on the task of lantern bearer or watch your brother perish. Wirt refuses though, he has finally found his own self-worth. He finally admits out loud to his mistakes and his shortfalls. It's my fault we ended up here. Everything's been my fault. I should have been more. No. And so, he no longer feels the need to cow to everyone around him, least of all the beast. Very briefly, the beast's eyes glow the same way that the dogs did in the first episode, as it tries to intimidate Wart. But it doesn't work. <clears throat> Are you? <gasps> Don't! Wirt realizes it isn't the woodsman's daughter in the lantern, rather the beast's essence is trapped in there. So he calls the beast's bluff, robbing it of all the power it would have had over them. Ultimately, Wirt leaves it up to the woodsman to finish the deed. The next thing we see is Wirt and Greg being rescued from the river they had fallen in, escaping the train. They are taken to the hospital where Sarah meets them. We're meant to believe, if taken literally, that it was all a dream they had had while they were unconscious in the river. Back over the garden wall, we see the woodsman reunited with his daughter, Lorna and Auntie Whispers living peacefully, Quincy Endicott and his lover together. The teacher, the pumpkin cult, everyone is together again. It's a mirror of the montage that we see in the intro song to the series, except now we get to see the impact that the boys had on the unknown. Even Beatrice and her family are reunited and human once again. So what was the unknown? Was it all just a dream as the ending would have you believe? Was it the afterlife or some sort of purgatory that the boys visited briefly when they fell into the river? Or was it something more abstract? As I said, I tend to think of it in less literal terms. Sure, the above answers are okay in their own right, but often we can get more out of media if we allow ourselves to think in more metaphorical terms. The unknown was a liminal space, a transitory world where Wirtz and Beatrice's shortcomings could be revealed. Not Greg, though. Greg is perfect, and I love him. The Beast was just a representation of all those negative things that were holding Wirtz back. The self-loathing, the second-guessing, the loneliness that he felt at times. Ultimately, the only power that the Beast had was that which was given to it. It was just a dark light, and once Wirt realized that, all it took was a simple breath to snuff it out. But it's not always easy or possible for us to see these things on our own. Sometimes we need a guiding light like Greg, or a jaded realist like Beatrice to help us snap back to reality. Oh, In the end, we see Wirt finally working up the courage to let Sarah listen to his mixtape. 
Though he's not an entirely different person. He, just like us, will still have those flaws in the back of his mind, but he doesn't have to feed them. At the beginning of the video, I asked you to close your eyes. I told you to remember your childhood and all the feelings you felt when you were in that transitional state between adolescence and adulthood. Yet, I didn't really need to do that. All I had to do was get you to sit down and watch over the garden wall, because that is exactly what watching it does. Before, I said that I couldn't pinpoint the exact memory that the show really hits at, but in writing this script, it actually came to me. When I was about 10 or so, there was a forest next to our neighborhood. Really, it was just a small patch of woods, but to us, it might as well have been a national park. Once or twice, we would find an area out there that would make for an excellent fort, as we called it. It was basically just a small clearing with some fallen trees that made for good benches. We would cut down small fir saplings and shave everything except for the end to use as a broom to clean up our individual spaces and make room for little construction projects. We would go out there to camp, make our own campfires, and come up with stories to tell each other. We'd let our imaginations run wild. In fact, I remember renting a book from the library called How to Build a Fort to get some ideas. Unfortunately, the book was a diary or an autobiography or something. Whatever it was, it did not give instructions on how to build a fort, which was a disappointment. Now, I hadn't thought about that fort in a long time, but when I think about it now, it was our own unknown, in a way. It was a small, isolated space where we could pretend to be adults, where we could problem-solve together and find interesting solutions. It's one of the best memories of my childhood, and I honestly have this show to thank for reminding me of those wonderful times. Over the Garden Wall is such a delight to the senses. It mixes these wonderfully disparate, yet somehow harmonious things like imagery and themes, and combines that with rich, wholesome characters. From the extremely talented voice acting cast to the incredible music, there's just so much to love about the show. Yet, I think the thing that keeps drawing me, and I believe others back to it time and again, is its ability to transport us to our childhoods. It does it in a way that no other show has been able to do quite so effectively. I really hope you enjoyed this video because I really enjoyed making it, both watching the show and writing this script. If you did enjoy it, please consider going to my Patreon and becoming a member because it really helps with this. I used a lot of clips from the show and I'm going to try to make it monetized, but most likely it's not going to be. Or even if it is, it's going to be a pretty big uphill battle. So please consider doing that and I will be back with more. I'll see you guys next time. Huge thank you to Isabel Brown, Elliot Salas, and Chase Hears for becoming my newest patrons. Thank you guys so much.